Good morning. I'd like to thank my co-authors here at Brigham Young University, as well as NASA Langley Research Center for working on this research together with me. I'd also like to thank the National Institute of Aerospace for funding and supporting this research. In terms of background, NASA is going to be testing the X-59 aircraft soon, and a visualization of this aircraft is shown here on the right. The goal of the X-59 aircraft is to produce shaped sonic booms, or low booms, also referred to sometimes as sonic thumps, which are designed to be quieter than traditional high amplitude sonic booms. The end goal of this is to fly the X-59 over different communities throughout the United States and gather human annoyance data as well as acoustic data so that a relationship can be established between the loudness of the booms and how annoyed people are. However, this will necessitate that recordings be made in indoor and urban environments, um, sorry, in outdoor and urban environments. And these kinds of measurements are extremely difficult. However, BYU has been researching measurements and different processing techniques for these kinds of situations for many years, and this presentation will give a high-level overview of several of the key results. I also want to highlight immediately, there will be more references later at the end of this presentation, but I want to highlight immediately that in addition to this NoiseCon proceedings paper, there are also going to be a proceedings of meetings on acoustics paper published through the Acoustical Society of America, and that will have much more information than the NoiseCon proceedings will. And even more information will be included in a soon to be published contractor report uh, that you'll be able to find on um, NASA's NTRS website. So an overview of the results here, we're gonna talk about ground-based versus elevated microphones, improving low frequency spectral data. We're gonna talk about the effects of turbulence on different sonic boom metrics and how to reduce ambient noise effects. So some quick results, since we don't have time to cover everything in detail here. We recommend that you use ground-based microphones instead of elevated microphones. We collaborated with Volpe uh, in a paper that talks all about this that you can see at this reference. We also recommend using digital pole shift filtering to enable you to use higher sensitivity microphones but then correct for their poor low frequency response. There's this trade-off where high sensitivity or low noise microphones tend to have poor low frequency responses, and then low sensitivity microphones can have better low frequency responses, but of course that changes our noise floors. And so what we see here is in this graph we have a sonic boom, uh, actual measured sonic boom, using two different microphones that were right next to each other. One is the PCB378A07 microphone, and the other one is the Gross 40AE. The Gross 40AE microphone it has a sensitivity roughly 10 times as high as the PCB microphone, so it has much lower noise, electronic noise. But the PCB microphone captures the low frequencies much more accurately, and that's why we see a difference between these two um, measurements. However, according to the information that you can find in these two references, we are able to correct for this using digital pulse shift filtering. And so that's, that's an exciting uh, thing that we're able to do with our hardware. We're, the next topic here is the effects of turbulence on sonic boom metrics. We're gonna go more in depth on this topic and on the next topic in today's presentation. So what we see here is we've got seven simultaneous sonic boom measurements all located within 400 feet of each other. The aircraft producing these sonic booms was an F-18 flying about 30,000 feet above the ground. And these microphones are spaced, again, 400 feet total aperture of this array. And if you imagine from 30,000 feet up, a 400 foot aperture on the ground is relatively small. And so nominally, we would expect that all of these microphones would be receiving the exact same sonic boom, especially because this array was oriented perpendicular to the flight track. But we don't see that. We see rather large discrepancies between these, these, these essentially adjacent measurements. And if we start looking at the different metric values here, we've got the perceived level in decibels as a function of the array location of the microphones. And you can see here for three different booms, we see large differences in this PL metric across the array. For example, for boom 21 pictured in blue here, 
between the measurement located at 50 feet and at plus 200 feet, we have a difference of about 8 dB. And so over 150 feet, we're getting 8 dB swings in our metric values. And notice that it's not consistent from boom to boom. It's not that there's one microphone that's always giving a certain type of measurement during each boom. Now, if we take every single one of these booms and subtract off their respected mean values, we can combine all of these you know, variabilities about the mean value into a common distribution. And that's what we have here in this histogram. This is the PL minus each boom's individual mean PL value. And there's this red a normal distribution shown here for um, extra visualization. When we actually run some statistical tests for normality on these distributions for all of the metrics, we tend to find that they are um, approximately normal distributions, at least for this data set. Now, if we take a look at some other metrics, we see that some metrics are more affected by turbulence than others. For example, the A-weighted sound exposure level metric has a wider distribution than the B-weighted sound exposure level metric. And a way to measure this uncertainty is to use the standard deviation indicated by these uh, orange arrows right here. Now, remember that twice the standard deviation, or in other words, within the span of plus or minus one standard deviation, captures about 66% of the distribution here. And four times the standard deviation, or what's within plus or minus two standard deviations, captures 95% of the distribution. Notice that the A-weighted sound exposure level here has the widest distribution again, 11.1 dB for plus or minus two standard deviations, and BSEL has the smallest distribution. So overall, we noticed that propagation through atmospheric turbulence does cause random distortions in the boom signatures, and this leads to a pretty wide distribution of metrics over relatively short distances. Remember that aperture of 400 feet should nominally be receiving about the same boom. But we're getting you know, 8 dB swings over 150 feet. It's also important to note that not all metrics are affected equally. And therefore, we recommend that a single measurement is probably not enough. You don't want to be caught in a situation where you made a measurement 100 feet away from someone's house, and that measurement is not representative at all of what the person might have heard uh, inside their house or in their backyard. Uh, and so we, we recommend using multiple microphones to get an idea of the uncertainty within each measurement. Uh, in addition to this, I want to add that there's lots of modeling that's been done on actual low booms, and we tend to see that the trends are about the same uh, using this, these modeling tools, but we also recommend that the this atmospheric turbulence variability for X59 booms be actually measured during X59 testing so that we can validate those models, but also gain better physical insight into the effects of atmospheric turbulence on low booms, which will be a very unique experiment to run uh, in the coming years. The next topic here to talk about in more detail today is reducing the effects of ambient noise. Now in this presentation, I'm going to use the term ambient noise to refer to both acoustic ambient noise and electronic and hardware ambient noise. Uh, we might also sometimes refer to that as just contaminating noise overall. But in general, ambient noise is going to refer to both in this presentation. So ambient noise is a problem for sonic boom measurements. For example, using this uh, sonic boom measurement, you see the ambient noise before the boom. And that ambient noise, we assume, continues to persist during the boom, but the question that we want to answer is how does that noise affect the boom metrics? Is it negligible? Is it a huge problem? We want to investigate this. And so to do this, we're using C609 simulated booms. Uh, the C609 booms come from a previous design iteration of the X59, uh, but in general, these are low boom simulations, and you can see one visualized here on the right. So we call this the clean boom. There's no noise of any kind in this boom. And then we superimpose real world ambient noise from Quiet Supersonic Flights 2018, a measurement campaign, on top of this clean boom. And we separate it into an ambient phase and a boom phase. And then we can produce spectra here. So we've got our sound exposure level, flat weighted spectrum as a function of frequency. 
you can see that the clean boom indicated in blue with the triangles has, you know, the highest amplitudes, you know, much higher than the pre-boom ambient noise at low frequencies. But at high frequencies, the ambient noise is actually having higher levels than the um, clean boom. And so when we make this mock recording by superimposing this ambient noise on top of the clean boom, we see that at low frequencies, it tends to follow the clean boom, but at high frequencies, it tends to follow the pre-boom ambient. Notice also that it doesn't exactly match up with the pre-boom ambient at high frequencies, and that's because the ambient noise is not actually stationary. We tend to make that assumption, but we need to remember that it's not, not fully true. And so if we take a look at the PL metrics here, for the clean boom, the PL was 76.1 dB. However, for the noisy boom, or this mock recording, it's actually 80.1 dB. So adding this ambient noise actually increased our metric value with a positive bias of 4.1 dB. Sorry, 4.0 4 dB. And so we propose the following technique for removing this ambient noise. We propose that you find where the boom spectrum hits the noise floor and then apply a low pass filter. So we'll go through these steps in a little bit more detail here in just a moment, but outline all together here, you calculate the SNR spectrum, you determine the 3 dB SNR frequency and apply a six order Butterworth filter with that corner frequency. So plotted here is our signal to noise ratio spectrum, again, shown as a function of frequency. And we see that at low frequencies, we have great signal to noise ratio. But at high frequencies, we have no signal to noise ratio anymore. And again, there's some bouncing around because of the lack of stationarity in the ambient noise. Here's our 3 dB indicator. And this frequency band right here at 400 Hertz is the first frequency band that drops below that 3 dB threshold. And so we make that our filter corner frequency. And when we apply that, we've got the same plot here from a few minutes ago. When we apply that, we have our filtered mock recording. It not only follows the curvature of the clean boom much closer, it also produces a filtered PL value that's within 0.1 dB of the clean PL value. So that was great. However, we also had the question of, to what extent do we need to try to match that high frequency spectral roll off of the clean boom? So to investigate this, instead of applying a six order Butterworth filter, we applied a brick wall filter, also uh, you'll see here referred to as a rectangular filter, and we see that it made no difference. So we could either apply the six order Butterworth filter, or you could apply you know, a brick wall rectangular filter and just ignore all the high frequency content above the cutoff frequency, and you get the same results. So that was really important, noting that for metric values, you don't need to do a lot of sophisticated matching of the high frequency roll off. So how does this compare to another state of the art technique? So ISO 11204 was adapted by Kloss in 2022 to have some more aggressive corrections than are originally afforded by, by that standard. The best recommendations or the best corrections in his work are custom E and custom F. And this was based off of his simulations involving turbulence, post boom noise, and we recommend looking at reference four at the end of this presentation for some more information. So a comparison can be made by applying all four of these corrections to the same exact data set. So we've got the Butterworth, we've got the rectangular or brick wall method, we've got the ISO 11204 custom E and custom F techniques. And what we see here now on the right is we took the C609 booms, we have 300 unique C609 booms in our data set, and we have a lot of different ambient noise recordings from QSF18. And so each C609 boom was randomly paired with different ambient noise to produce 300 mock recordings. And then we could do the same analysis that we previously did for each boom and say, okay, when we apply these different filters, how close do we actually get to that original clean boom perceived level? So what we see here is the PL difference from the clean boom here. And we see that both of the ISO methods do a good job. They get, they get it pretty close to zero. 
And so the ISO 11204 corrections do produce good results. When we throw the Butterworth and rectangular slash brick wall methods on here, we see that those also produce favorable results. And so overall, we see that the Butterworth and rectangular filters produce results that are at least as good as the ISO 11204 methods. And therefore, this is a, a highly promising result because it indicates that we have multiple redundant methods of removing ambient noise. And by redundant, I mean they work differently, and so they are going to have different strengths and weaknesses than each other. And therefore, we recommend that multiple different methods should be used for ambient noise removal during X59 recordings because these different methods can cross-check each other and help to validate the ambient noise removal results. And so in summary here, we recommend using ground-based microphones. We recommend using digital pulse shift filtering to enable you, you, you to use higher sensitivity microphones and then correct for poor low frequency response. And that's very beneficial for metric calculations so that we don't run into high frequency noise issues. Uh, although we can remove those effects using these correction methods, it's always better to have less ambient noise to remove in the first place. We recommend using noise monitors at uh, multiple noise monitors to get an idea of the uncertainty in each measurement location. I recommend that a simple Butterworth or rectangular filter can be used to filter out ambient noise, and that this should be used in collaboration with some of these other state-of-the-art methods. We also found that trying to exactly match that high-frequency spectral roll-off is not important for metric calculations. And it's also important to know that uh, different metrics are affected differently by ambient noise and turbulence. You know, perceived level and A-weighted sound exposure level tend to be much more impacted than B-weighted sound exposure level and D-weighted sound exposure level, for example. And here is a list of references uh, relating to this presentation. I also want to note two references here that uh, have, don't show up here yet uh, and are yet to be published. There's going to be, again, that Proceedings of Meetings on Acoustics paper published through the Acoustical Society of America. It's going to cover the same material that's covered in this presentation and its accompanying NoiseCon uh, paper, uh, but it's going to cover it in much more detail than was discussed there. And then we've also got a new contractor report similar to Reference 7 that's going to cover all of this same information again, uh, with the exception of the digital pole shift filtering. And so we recommend keeping an eye out for these upcoming publications that are going to show much more information. Of course, you can always contact myself or Dr. Kent L. Gee at BYU for uh, further information regarding all of these things. And with that, I'd like to thank you for uh, listening to this presentation today. Thank you.